<clears throat> Thank you very much. Everything begins with a story, ladies and gentlemen. On the morning of 9-11, I was a student at the University of Minnesota in the United States. Before I realized anything had happened, my father calls me early in the morning and he says, Sleiman, if anybody asks you your name, tell them your name is Jose and you're from Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, he was worried about me, and he was right, I should have listened to him. Shortly afterwards, uh, I got attacked by a group of men for no other reason other than being an Arab. So I had a decision to make at the time. Um, am I going to go back home, be angry for the rest of my life, beat up white people for the rest of my life? But then I realized something. Those people who attacked me had a single narrative, a single story about Arabs and Middle Easterners, and that is the narrative of 9-11. It's no wonder they were violent towards me. So I thought to myself, the best way to fight that kind of extremism and that racism is to start with the young, give them alternative narratives. So I started going to school children ages six to seven uh, around the suburbs, talking to them about Middle Eastern culture, spreading a message of hope, tolerance, and basically letting, letting the kids know that we're not all Al-Qaeda. In one of the schools, um, uh, I was talking to a first grade, a six-year-old girl stands up, she's like, Slayman, Slayman, I have a question. I'm like, okay, what's your question? She's like, is there an Arabic Barbie? Uh, the boys go crazy. Is there an Arab Superman? Is there an Arab Batman? I'm like, you know what? Actually, there isn't. Um, I couldn't get the idea out of my head. Why did they ask that question? Why were they, well, you know, why did they want to know that so bad? And if I wanted to answer it, what kind of heroes would we have? What kind of stories would we tell? So I started sketching for the first time in my life, started creating stories for the first time in my life. Um, dropped out of my master's program, eventually went back to Jordan and started a comic book company. And in the year 2010, published and sold more than 1.2 million comic books, reaching more than 4 million youth in Jordan. Now what started, oh, thank you. Thank you. What started out as a simple uh, question by a six-year-old girl turned into this sketch and turned into this. What's really interesting is when I was 10 years old, my parents hired a private tutor to teach me art and music. And after one week, she gave him back all the money and told me, you don't have a creative bone in your body. <laughs> I hope she's watching this right now. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you about some of the stories that we're working on. Um, uh, what, this story actually was developed with uh, um, uh, young kids in Jordan, primarily uh, young women, uh, young ladies. Because they were like, we want, to, we want you to create a story for us. So after numerous focus groups, etc., we decided on this story. And this is a story about, uh, basically it's a modern retelling of the 1001 Night Story, the story of Princess Shahrazad. And uh, they made every single decision from the colors, the characters, everything. They were the editors of the story. See, uh, there's a little trick. If you really want to know what the kids want, uh, just ask them. Um, this is another story about, about post-apocalyptic Middle East set up 100 years in the future. It's called Salah Ad-Din 2100. It's supposed to, uh, the idea is, what kind of world would we live in 100 years from now uh, in, in the Middle East? Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to publish the story because I couldn't answer the question uh, to the censorship board of who's going to be the leader 100 years from now. Uh, and this is one of my most important stories. It's called Section 9. It's the story uh, of the first counterterrorism unit in Jordan, all female. This is a real-life unit that's exist, that exists in, uh, today. So I thought this is an incredibly powerful narrative that we need to teach the youth. Uh, uh, one, we need to ch challenge the image of women, the traditional image of women, uh, and we need to teach the youth women empowerment. Now, here's the interesting thing is, while I was doing my research, um, I looked at the textbooks in, the, in, in Jordan. Let me translate this section that I found. This is a photo from one of the textbooks. It says, women are less equal than boys. Uh, and men, and they're less smart, and they cannot face real life without a man on their side. This is what we're teaching the kids as science in schools. This is why these narratives and these stories are incredibly important. Unfortunately, it was deemed too dangerous for our values and traditions. But, you know, we keep on going, nonetheless. One of the things I do in, in Jordan is I do a lot of focus groups. I go talk to kids from different demographics, different areas in Jordan. So, uh, when I first went back, I asked them, who are your heroes? And I was shocked in one of the sessions um, I was talking to the kids and like, who are your heroes? And looked at me like, well, we don't have real heroes in the sense of the word, but we hear a lot about Laden. We hear a lot about Zarqawi. I'm like, well, what do you hear about them? That they're protecting us, they're defending us. I'm like, defending you against whom? I'm like, they're protecting us, they're defending, defending us against the West and against the government because they want to come here and kill us. And that's, by the way, terrorist narrative 101, that the West is at war with Islam. So I didn't want to argue with the kids. Instead, I gave them my comic books for free for a few months. Came back 
few months later, ask them the same exact question. Not a single kid is talking about Bin Laden and Zarqawi. They're all talking about the comic book characters. And that's when I learned there's a huge appetite for positive heroism, for real heroes that these kids can look up to. And it is really incredibly dangerous to have you know, Bin Laden and Zarqawi be the role models. In the West, kids grow up on Harry Potter, you know, Katniss, Hunger Games, uh, some of the old folks like me, you know, Star Wars, The Matrix, etc. Uh, to have kids grow up thinking that Bin Laden is their hero is one of the most dangerous things that we have going on in the Middle East. So that's when I decided to embark on a journey, uh, doing a lot of research, ex trying to understand extremist narratives and extremist mythology. And please, let me just say this word. Understanding is not excusing it. But if we want to prevent it, we really need to dig deep and understand it like they do. Now, why is it so important to understand extremist narratives and mythology? I'm not talking about messages. I'm not talking about propaganda. They're narratives. Because narratives, ladies and gentlemen, the stories we tell ourselves uh, give us a compelling sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, tell us where, who, we, who we are, where we're heading. And similarly, with collective groups like extremists, it can actually reveal their identity, what their goals, their objectives, but more important, how they recruit, and how they you know, manage to attract so many youth. So let me tell you about some of the major extremist narratives. Uh, the, probably the ultimate meta-narrative is that the West is at war with Islam, that the West is out there to, to, to pillage and you know, take our lands and, 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 and kill Muslims. In this view, uh, the world is basically divided between Muslims and non-Muslims. And according to the extremists, non-Muslims are not honorable and violence is, is, uh, is justified towards them. Now, um, there's these two other narratives that are, that are very critical. Uh, in Arabic, we call them the takfir narratives. These are the narratives used to justify the killing of innocent people. So the first one is the infidel narrative, which is the, uh, you know, the infidel invaders. It's actually a recount of the crusader narrative, you know, the crusades uh, a, hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago. Um, the second one is the hypocrite narrative, and they use that to describe other Muslims who don't agree with them. And in that view, in that narrative, basically Musl uh, those Muslims, the hypocrites, uh, they are basically Muslim on the outside, and on the inside, they're considered to be traitors. They're not true to the, to the religion. And in that mythology, in extremist mythology, that's the most dangerous type of people out there. And in fact, this explains, if you look at all extremist uh, movements, most of them actually end up killing more Muslims than anyone else. Al-Qaeda killed more Muslims than anyone else. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why their violence is actually directed more towards who they consider to be the hypocrites. Now, another really major theme is the heroic journey. What do I mean by that? Now, uh, Joseph Cam this is based on the work of Joseph Campbell, a famous mythologist. He studied the mytho mythologies from all over the world and basically came down to the conclusion that, human that humankind has one single story, and that is the, st the, the journey of the hero. And here's what's really fascinating about this. Uh, there's three stages to this, depart you know, departure, initiation, and return. So what is the ultimate heroic journey in Islam? or even in, in Arabic culture right now. It's the, it's the journey of the Prophet Muhammad. So the Prophet Muhammad, you know, he lived, he had a middle, a middle class life, he had a comfortable life, but he felt something was wrong. So he went to the caves and started meditating. And in those caves, you know, the angel Gabriel came and gave him the message of Islam, and then he emerged transformed uh, with the message of Islam to unite all Arabs around. Now what's really fascinating is Bin Laden emulated this journey to the letter. Bin Laden, a wealthy aristocrat from Saudi Arabia, left a life of wealth, went to the deserts in Afghanistan, and uh, came out with a vision of violent uh, jihad against, uh, against the West and everybody who shamed and caused humiliation towards Muslims. And here's what's really fascinating. Some of the latest research shows that Bin Laden, from the very early stages when he went to Afghanistan, took cameras with him and was taping himself and taping everything that was going on. He was building the myth from day one. This was an, intelli this was an intelligent design and effort. And you know, he was very successful, unfortunately. So um, now, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, I started publishing a few hundred thousand comic books. Um, unfortunately, I got attacked outside of my office by extremists with a razor blade across my face uh, in an effort to try and stop me from doing my work. Now. Um, Here's what's really interesting. Two things happened as a result. One, my dating life improved exponentially. <laughs> um, two, uh, and this actually led me to one of the biggest discoveries in, in the CVE field and in my professional life. Um, Rumi said 
you know, wounds are the place where the light comes in. I think he had it half right. It's also the place where the light shines from. Uh, so, in, in, in my culture, when somebody strikes you in the face with a razor blade, uh, we call that in Arabic, ta'lime, which means to mark you, mark you with shame. So you're always marked with shame. And I thought to myself, hmm, there's an interesting dynamic here going on with shame. So I started doing uh, serious research about shame. So let me tell you a little bit about shame. Shame, is the co psychologically speaking, is the core feeling that there's something defective, something wrong with me as a human being. Um, and shame can take multiple forms, uh, humiliation, um, and it can be also s uh, silly stuff. For example, I'm not tall enough, I don't have enough hair. I have a lot of hair, just really bad distribution, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I just want you to notice what I just did. I diminished my feelings of shame with humor. And that helped me actually connect with you even more. Uh, so that's a healthy way to deal with shame. Now, a very non-healthy way to deal with shame, toxic shame, is when it becomes so intense, um, it becomes your identity. And when that happens, here's what we, what we know. That from the latest research, we know that shame is the root cause of all violence. Not only that, when you feel intense feelings of shame, human beings tend to look for mood alters, ways to diminish your feelings of shame. And guess what the latest re research shows on addiction? That all addiction is also rooted in shame. And here's what's fascinating about, about shame and extremism. Their entire mythology is based on shame and augmenting shame and projecting shame towards what they consider to be the other, the non-believers. Um, and this is not something new. We've seen this before. Uh, Bin Laden emerged from the caves uh, with a vision of quote-unquote violent jihad towards uh, the West to cleanse the shame and humiliation of the Muslims. Well, guess what? Hitler came to power on the promise to cleanse the shame of the Treaty of Versailles, and he directed it towards the Jews. And in fact, we, we see the same shame dynamic in most violent groups. Uh, okay. So why do youth... And this is actually, sorry, so this is actually very consistent with all the latest research that we know about why youth join these extremist groups. Uh, it turns out um, what we used to know is not right. You know, the traditional assumptions that it's poverty, unemployment, and it's criminals who join these groups turned out to be false. Uh, actually, it turns out that the reason why the youth join is because it provides them with a sense of identity and belonging, it provides them um, uh, with the, the heroic journey, the glamorous call to adventure. Um, and, you know, because of a, a, an intense sense of humiliation and shame. And this is consistent with their entire mythology. So let me actually, how about we hear from a couple of guys who are former extremists. He, they joined extremist groups and they actually ended up leaving. And I want you to hear from them directly why they joined. They were offering something which, you know, I, you know, I never had before. A family, understanding, belonging. This is where the journey starts. In South London, I grew up in a white working class community. I had no interest in Islam whatsoever. I hated being brown. I hated being Pakistani. I hated being Muslim. Why did you uh, hate being brown? Because I grew up in a, an environment where there was non stop racism. Brown people were seen as lesser, second class. And, you know, it was just that inferiority complex that you have. There was nothing to celebrate about who you were, especially in an environment where everyone else is white. You want to fit in. You know, and you fit in how? By being just like everyone else, but more so, overcompensating, over-exaggerating. I, I had my white girlfriends, and then middle-class parents saying, oh, but you'll have mongrel children. These were middle-class, so-called middle-class educated parents, you know, who were, who were doing this. I've done everything to fit in. I've even got the white girlfriend and everything else. And still you're not accepted, bizarrely. Still you're not accepted. Munir is another man who was marked by his past. I had serious issues coming to terms with the way I looked, the physical impairment from birth. I grew up feeling emasculated anyway because of my disability. And I'd walk home from school as a six-year-old on my own and sometimes be heckled and sometimes chased and threatened. I'd have things thrown at me. P A K I G. O H O M E. I heard that religiously, like the five times call to prayer for the first 16 years of my life. I felt so shunned by everybody. I felt so alone, so isolated. I just felt like death would have been a really good option. I didn't have a passion for life. Martyrdom, the notion of the Shaheed, the Mujahid, they became inspiring. They very much became enabling. I think for me, I was unmistakably drawn to it. 
This is from a fascinating movie by filmmaker Dia Khan. It's called Jihad. I strongly recommend it. Um, what's really fascinating is those two guys right now are actually activists working against uh, violent extremism and working with the youth in London to try and prevent them from making their same mistakes. And they're, they're having amazing success. What's really fascinating is this guy right here, his name is Abu Muntasir. He is the founder, basically, of, 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 of Western Jihad. He's the guy responsible for spreading Jihad in London, the UK, and actually most of Western Europe. He was their idol. And in, in the movie, they actually talk about how he was their hero. And they were just dying to meet him. And this is the way they got indoctrinized into this uh, mythology. Now, what's really interesting is this founder and leader recently recanted. And he changed his ways and now is actually working against violent extremism. And I want you to hear his story, how... When he, how empathy led uh, to him leaving those extremist groups. The one, the one story that affects me the most concerning Burma is in the jungles when I met two brothers, 13 years old. I try to visualize my son and daughter in the same position. It's not the suffering I'm being in the jungle and living in the dirt and eating poor food. It's the idea and the picture of them, my son and daughter, carrying guns to be maimed or blown up at the behest of leaders and commanders who fight for a false ideal and an unwinnable war and those two boys came to me my children may want to not go to school and run away from homeworks they came to me and they begged me to take them with me and they said they were not lying. You can tell when people are lying. 13 year olds staring at me. I just want to go to school. We can make the difference and we didn't. I'd rather live as slaves and have my kids go to school. I don't want this false. What is this honor? I'm happy to be a coward. So, ladies and gentlemen, what do we do? Uh, one of the biggest problems that we face is we really need to challenge our existing assumptions. And it's not enough to be against extremism. What are we for? It's not enough just to have a counter-narrative, but are we for something greater? These, these extremists are offering these youth uh, a sense of belonging, identity, a glamorous call to adventure. What are, we have to offer them something bigger. ISIS's ability and Al-Qaeda's ability to sell these youth uh, death speaks more about our inability to sell them on life. See, I, I view these kids and these youth who join these extremist groups as victims of this ideology. We need to change our perspective. Even if we press a button today, and kill every extremist out there, there'll be more extremists born uh, uh, and more groups being, being formed. We really need to stop them, stop the youth and have a preventative strategy. Stop the youth from joining these extremist groups. So, and one of the best ways to do that is you know, develop uh, heroic role models, develop heroic stories based on narratives of hope, of resilience, of connection to others, of service to others, of acceptance and tolerance. Because believe it or not, these extremists, when they come and they talk to these youth, they come and tell them, we'll accept you no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is. It's actually a message of acceptance initially. So we need to offer them something greater. And obviously, this is going to take time. One of, the, one, of the, one of the big questions that I get asked all the time is, oh my God, but this is going to take generations. Yes, it will. Because the cost of, you know, we haven't done anything over the last few years, and we forgot this and ignored this. And you know what the cost of doing nothing is? It's ISIS. We're seeing that today. Um, last but not least, uh, it's, inc it's incredibly critical to start today. There's a lot of real-life heroes available today, like those guys. You know, they were able to transform their lives, and now they're doing unbelievable work. 
Uh, last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, the time for heroes has been and will always be right here and right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You can stay on oh, the stage to the Q&A. Thank you. We have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, you think about some questions uh, and, and raise your hand. I'll just ask one in the meantime. I, one thing that, that, one of the many things that really struck me uh, in what we just heard was this choice. He said, I'd rather live as a slave and have my children go to school than, than, than have my children uh, be armed. So is there, is there, a, uh, is this a common feeling? Uh, among Muslims in the Middle East and elsewhere, that the choice is between slavery and martyrdom, that these are the only opportunities, or these are the only alternatives that exist today. Is, th is that a common feeling? Well, let me tell you this. The extremists would love nothing more than to paint the world in that picture. Mm. They want to tell people, you, the only two options you have is either martyrdom or a violent jihad and kill yourself, or live like a slave and live a life of shame. And the most striking thing for me was when he said, what is this honor? This is not honor. The, you know, there's no honor in dying for a false cause and hurting uh, and killing innocent people. The real honor is to live, uh, you know, to live your life for a cause rather than to die for something. Do we have some questions from the audience? Everyone's overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Be brave. All right. Up there? Can you wave again? Yep, it's uh, in the dark spot there. Yeah, I can't. I can't see. Is is the mic? Are the microphones running? I can hear you. Go, can you speak go. loud, please? Yeah, shout to. Let, let's see. Is there another microphone? Ah, is coming. Can okay. you can you wave uh, the, your hand again? So. He said I didn't mention politics uh, uh, at all. Uh, well, I only have 20 minutes, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk briefly uh, about briefly. politics. Briefly. Uh, look, um, uh, here's the thing about politics. Yes, the situation in the Middle East, um, uh, the illegal invasion in Iraq, uh, created an environment that actually enabled those guys to really thrive uh, and multiply and you know, grow in an un unprecedented manner. And yes, there are grievances. Some of these policies, to be honest, by the West and the Middle East, uh, have some people over there have some true grievances with some of those policies. And some of them were unjust. However, um, and extremists do an incredible job of using that to fuel the shame and the anger of the people and make them join these groups. However, here's something that's important to note. Islamic extremism was there before there was a West, before there was Sweden, before there were any of these policies. The first four caliphates uh, in Islam, you know, the first one was Abu Bakr and there's other three. The, the other three, they were killed by people who considered them to be infidels. So violent extremism in, in, in Islam has been there for a very long time. And obviously, you know, some, some of the political situations, the invasions, uh, and some of the poverty and the oppression that's happening there, obviously that doesn't help and fuels it and makes it stronger. But it's not a primary cause. And at the end of the day, this is a civil war between Islam. This is a war uh, uh, for us Muslims to figure out what kind of Islam do we want to go, uh, do we want to have going forward in the next 10, 20 years? Is it going to be this violent jihad, an 8th century interpretation? Or are we going to go uh, towards a moderate, uh, you know, m more progressive version of Islam? And here's the thing, a message to all my fellow Muslims all over the world. It's not enough anymore for us to tolerate new ideas. We need to start embracing them. And we need to do that right away. If we don't change the world, the world will change us. Oh. So, do we have another question? There's right a couple here. there, and there's one there. Okay, then we'll just repeat it back to you. Uh, okay. What kind of reactions do you get from, if you allow the word, the mainstream Jordan, uh, you name them the infidels, the guys who is not uh, extremists? Do, you, do they buy your job? Do they want to help you? And yeah, yeah. What's happening there? So what's the answer, what's the response from mainstream jo Jordan? Oh, no, no, mainstream Jordan is actually pretty supportive. Uh, overall, look, the overall majority of um, uh, Arabs and Muslims are against extremism. The problem is they're very silent. And we cannot be silent anymore. Uh, so we need, really need to stand up, speak up, and show those minority that, you know what, this is not the kind of life that we want. And this is not the kind of Islam that we want. Uh, but you're seeing a lot of very brave people that are starting to speak up. But the problem is, and I'm, uh, I apologize, I have to take a swipe at the media here. Every time an ISIS guy farts or tweets, it's all over the media, all over the world. 
there's a lot of stories about people in the field, average people who are doing incredible work and trying to stop extremism. Uh, but we don't hear those stories, unfortunately, because they're not sexy. They don't fit the overall narrative that, these, to some, that, you know, to, that makes people watch and make the ratings go high and so on. So part of the responsibility is, uh, lies in the media. We need to really work together to try and bring some of those stories and let people like you and everybody else know about them. Then, uh, finally, I need to ask you very briefly this. There was, it, it a, there seems, was a question there. Um, yeah, do we, sorry, where was the other so, question? Yeah, there you go, yeah. over there. Uh, Ah, okay. So, um, yeah, I worked with actually, an, uh, uh, I work with a group of international writers, uh, uh, editors, uh, colorists, and so on. Uh, Process-wise, because you know, we got um, I do my stories to tailor for to counter CVE in Jordan and do women empowerment. I create all the or the original stories, sketches, etc. And then it's a collaborative process. Um, but you know, uh, we it's it's very tricky. But as you see, the results are amazing. And it makes actually these comic books scale easily and be, uh, have a huge international appeal. Uh, so it's been a very rewarding. And at the end of the day, uh, this is a, one of the perfect counter-narratives to, to the ultimate extremist narrative, that the West is at, war, is at war with Islam. Well, you know, I'm working with people from all over the world, the West and, non, and, and you know, uh, all over the world, on creating these stories. And obviously, we're having great success. They're helping me create the next generation of heroes for the Arab world. And I think that's an incredibly powerful counter-narrative. So it seems that the answer has to do with joy and creativity and the arts and, and providing much more complicated stories than the ones that the media loves. Uh, can we, uh, the, 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 those of us who are not Muslims or, or are, are part of the West, as it were, what can we do? A good question. Uh, you can start in your own communities, in your own lives. Simple acts of kindness. Uh, one former violent uh, um, extremist, uh, he's a vi he was a former violent uh, white racist, actually, in, in the U.S. I'm working with him now. A uh, good friend of mine. I guess what helped him change um, and quit and challenged everything he knew? He went into a fast food joint, and there was uh, a, a, an old black woman. And he told me she had such a smile, and she treated me with such kindness. For the first time, I felt really ashamed. And that was the moment for him that he decided to change. Simple acts of kindness. Mamlo, by the way, you guys have a great counter-narrative going on here. The diversity, uh, the tolerance that you have in, in this city um, is amazing and very powerful. You know, keep doing what you're doing. Those kind of stories, we need to hear about the stories here in Mamlo and, Malmo and what's happening. Uh, this could be a great, powerful example for the rest of Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, Sleiman Bakit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.